Paul, my name is Jorge Arbashi. I am from uh, the Development Bank of Latin America, CAF. Uh, it's a great pleasure uh, to have you all here to participate in this uh, very interesting and, and timely panel on the role of development financial institutions in mobilizing resources to a non-zero objective. This uh, panel is organized by ABDE, the Brazilian Association of Development uh, Institutions, and the, uh, the Brazilian Development Bank, BNDS, and is hosted by IDFC here in the, in, in the COP26 in, in Glasgow. Uh, I have a, a panel of distinct uh, 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 people who have been contributing a lot to, to this agenda. They include uh, Mr. Bruno Aranha, who is director of BNDS, Mr. Sergio Guzman Chuchodovsky, who is already, who is coming, and he, he will join us later on. Professor Stephanie Griffith Jones, who, by the, uh, by, by the way, I have met uh, for the, this is the third time that I met her in the last two months, perhaps not by coincidence, Professor Jones. And then Mr. Luis Awazu Pereira da Silva, Deputy Di uh, General Director of uh, BIS. And, uh, 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 Miss, uh, Mr. Damien uh, Navizet, senior climate expert at Cassia de Deposit de Depot. Uh, the topic of this uh, panel is on how to finance uh, the transition to a low emission economy uh, and a new development model. Uh, this is pretty much the topic of this COP26. We have been talking a lot over, this, uh, over these days about uh, the two sides of, of the coin, how to promote uh, 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 this transition, but we, we, have, uh, we have also to, take, uh, uh, to pay attention to a very critical topic, which is how to finance this transition. And we are very aware of the need, uh, uh, of, uh, the need of resources required for, the, for, for this transition. Uh, just, for, just to share with you uh, uh, one of the uh, uh, reports that I, I have read uh, recently, published by IFC uh, two months ago, I think, they estimated that only for Latin America, projects in only four sectors will require $2.6 trillion up to 2030. This is only to Latin America. And for you to have an idea of how much money it is in relation to what is the money that uh, 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 develop multi, uh, multi, uh, lateral development institutions can put on the table, they all together uh, provided less than $40 billion last year to Latin America. How much is this $40, 40 billion? This is about 20% of the average annual amount of foreign direct investments in the same region. So this is not much. If, it, if this is the case, the question is whether and how these institutions and the national, and the national development banks can contribute to, the, to, to this agenda, considering that it will require so much money, so much capacity, so much uh, in terms of resources. Uh, I guess that it is uh, very much related not to the amount, but how these institutions will do their job. And this is, this is the topic of, of this, uh, of this uh, uh, panel. Uh, this panel is organized, in, is organized in the following way. We have uh, uh, four panelists. Uh, each of one will have about 10 minutes to present uh, ideas, provoke uh, uh, the participants to share thoughts, uh, uh, to instigate us around uh, this, uh, this, uh, this topic. And then we have about 30 minutes for discussions with uh, the, the online and with the present public. So I, uh, 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 without further ado, I'd like to start inviting Mr. Bruno Aranha to start uh, sharing his points. Thank you very much, Mr. Bruno. Hello. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you, Jorge. Uh, well, um, 
in the in the in order to to discuss uh, the mobilization of resources to the net zero economy, I think that we we need to uh, to pass through uh, three pillars. The first one is like funding, as you said, and uh, I think that we we can access uh, different uh, three channels in order to do that. The first one is a uh, public market. Uh, and I think that uh, the development bank can uh, issue like green bonds, sustainability bonds, uh, in order to, to pre prepare themselves in order to do that. Uh, for example, BNDS, which is the Brazilian Development Bank, uh, it, uh, it, uh, it was a pioneer uh, in, in, in Brazil. It's the first bank to issue a green bond in uh, 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 2017, issue one billion dollars. Uh, and uh, the, the demand was uh, like uh, nine, nine times this, uh, this amount. So uh, a huge interest, uh, a huge uh, demand for the, the private sector. And uh, last, last year, in the middle of the pandemic, we issued again a uh, uh, green bond uh, directed to the local market, uh, another one, one billion, uh, and very successful. Um, but uh, uh, BNDS uh, uh, would like to improve and have uh, another uh, options and possibilities. So uh, we constructed a, a framework uh, in order to issue sustainability bonds. And uh, we are now uh, waiting for the correct moment of the market in order to issue, uh, uh, the, to do this, this first issuance of uh, sustainability bonds. Uh, I think that we have um, a huge partnership with, uh, with multilaterals, as, uh, as uh, yourself. And, uh, and, uh, and um, uh, nowadays, we have uh, uh, 14, uh, 14 agreements with different uh, multilaterals. Uh, uh, the BNDS has issued like, um, like uh, $3 billion. And, uh, and then we have uh, another uh, agreements in order to do that. Uh, in the f uh, uh, in the future, uh, another three billion, and uh, the last one was uh, with uh, NDB, which uh, uh, we raised uh, five hundred million dollars in order to invest in green econ economy. Um, we can also uh, access uh, uh, resources with uh, with government, uh, with uh, like uh, thematic uh, funds, as we have uh, climate fund. Uh, uh, Amazon fund that we are uh, a manager, uh, and then this is a, a third way in order to to mobilize and, uh, and fundraising uh, for the uh, for investing in, in the green economy. And uh, another pillar is uh, uh, is allocation. Allocation is a uh, 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 is a, like a, a problem I've after fundraising. Uh, we need to. Uh, in, we need to, to have projects in order to allocate these uh, these resources, and uh, we have uh, disimbursed. Uh, 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 I think since uh, 2015, um, uh, 18 billion dollars uh, in the green economy. We supported uh, projects that uh, avoided the emission of carbon as a uh, uh, 15 uh, 50 million tons of carbon uh, with these projects, which means like uh, 19 years without cars in the city of Sao Paulo. So uh, uh, I think that uh, uh, these, uh, these are a kind of role that uh, uh, the, the, the development banks can do, uh, like allocation this capital in different projects in the green economy. We, we are part of the, the Brazilian Green Growth Program uh, which was launched by the by the Brazilian government uh, in this uh, in this month, uh, and we are part of that, and we will disburse in this in this program uh, uh, around 20 billion uh, dollars within f uh, five years. Uh, again, in green projects like, like uh, uh, renewable energy, uh, waste management, uh, urban mobility. And other uh, in uh, other sectors, and, uh, and finally, uh, I think that we have the duty in order to construct new products uh, and new facilities in order to attract this this money and uh, to and then to allocate this money, uh, and uh, we can do do like uh, projects and uh, 
since uh, since uh, I think 2020, uh, BNDS like launched a new line uh, as a, a as a, a project factor of the of the state of a union states and municipalities in order to try to collaborate with them in order to to, to construct and to elaborate these projects that we receive this money. So another uh, uh, another uh, line of uh, uh, of, uh, of business uh, and then we are we are doing that for example uh, with sanitation concessions which is uh, it's a huge problem in Brazil and uh, and they have a, a, a opportunity to attract the private sector the private investments and uh, doing that about concessions and uh, trying to 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 construct with the with the state uh, well, we have blended finance that combine grants and, and, and loans, uh, and then the grants can leverage these uh, this credits and have more access to, uh, to SMEs and, uh, and rural uh, uh, families. Guarantees, which means that uh, we can uh, like, uh, uh, mitigate the risks using these guarantee funds and other, uh, uh, other types of guarantees in order to make possible uh, to disimburse uh, our uh, resources and also the private uh, resources of the, the, the banks and etc. And um, we, uh, we also are developing uh, another product which is a MET fund that we, we can uh, like put a w one, one dollar and the private sector another dollar in order to, uh, to support projects in health and education and uh, reforestation for example. Uh, so, uh, in order to congregate uh, private, uh, uh, private sector and public sector, in the in the in a good way, and uh, and finally, I think that we we can uh, uh, we can uh, work together with our clients with uh, linked loans that uh, we 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 uh, uh, we uh, require some uh, some movements some uh, some measures uh, uh, with the, the our clients uh, using financial incentives in order to pra to uh, uh, to uh, stimulate good practice so uh, we launched a ESG uh, credit uh, that requires our clients to get social certification or get environment certification uh, also like making a carbon in inventory uh, or stimulate that they uh, reduce uh, 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 the, its emissions in some uh, percentage, and uh, in the other side, we like uh, uh, um, minor or reduce their interest rates in the in disagreements. So uh, we like align the interests and make this m this movement possible. So I'm trying to figure out uh, all this uh, uh, all the things like again funding, allocation and new products, I think it's the pillar that uh, we can uh, uh, do our main role in this, in, this, uh, in this transition to the neutral economy. Thank you, Mr. Arena. Uh, uh, perhaps beyond these three pillars, I think that you mentioned two, uh, in my view, very important topics. One is mobilization, resource mobilization, and the other one, which is perhaps even more important, which is helping market formation. Uh, in Brazil through uh, these uh, financial instruments and others. And you mentioned something that I'd like to come back later on with all of you, uh, which is uh, the, the carbon market, which is perhaps a very important way to go uh, for many regions, including Latin America. Uh, I'd like to move over and uh, invite Mr. Sergio Guzman Shushodovsky, who is uh, CEO of ABDE and, and uh, BDMG. Mr. Shoshodovsky, the floor is yours. Thank you, Georgie. Um, thank you, Bruno. I would like to salute our good friends, Professor Stephanie Griffith Jones, who's been uh, leading and teaching and researching and acting in this field for so many years. Uh, it's truly an honor to partake and, and, and share this panel with you. The same uh, for Luis Pereira uh, da Silva, uh, our Deputy Managing Director at the Basel Bank, 
And I also salute Damien Navizé, representing Caisse de Depot. Uh, indeed, uh, a true honor to, to join you from uh, afar. Uh, just a few days ago, I was in presence in Glasgow at this uh, very uh, venue. And I also take the opportunity to thank our good friends from ITFC in the person of Rémi Rieu, uh, Beril, and all uh, the team that uh, may be uh, there uh, right now and just saluting all the uh, audience in uh, general. Uh, I have the great honor to represent today the 31 development finance institutions that are members of the Brazilian Development Association. We have celebrated our, we are just about to celebrate our 52, 52nd anniversary. Uh, and uh, this represents a historical milestone in the sense of having an association in a developing country that is delivering with capillarity and with one of the most robust um, development finance uh, systems in the world, uh, programs that will certainly help our country, Brazil, achieve uh, the ambitions of the Paris Agreement, of the Agenda 2030, and of the Agenda of uh, Action of Addis Abeba uh, that relates to um, finance for development. The, um, it's interesting in this uh, first week of COP, and now that we are just uh, halfway through the second week, how many initiatives all around the world we were able to uh, see, to learn uh, from, especially solutions that uh, were uh, enabled uh, and successful solutions in developing countries. Many of them backed by partnerships with multilateral uh, development banks, with uh, international or national development agencies, which is the, ca the case for Agence Française de Développement, and, uh, but so many others who are very active in uh, this field. So uh, in, in this sense, I, I think we, we need to talk about reinforcing the development financial institutions role. Uh, we all know that the DFI's mandates are focused on fostering social and economic development, and they deploy a wide range of instruments to do so. Historically, these institutions have been consistently instrumental to social and economic advancements, right? We all have the uh, image of the World Bank being created uh, during the Bretton Woods meetings in 1944 uh, and the rebuild of a destructed world. Uh, bear in mind that the first operation from the World Bank was to France, uh, which uh, then was a devastated country uh, because of, of the war. Throughout uh, the decades, these initiatives, they grew to other missions, such as reducing economic and social inequalities, fostering transition to use of renewable sources of energy, anti-cyclical, counter-cyclical measures to support the economy in times of crisis, such as the ones that we are uh, living in uh, right now. But I think a big change happened just a few years ago, especially in 2015, uh, when DFIs also started to commit with a sustainable development agenda, with a climate agenda, and with responsibilities related to the challenges of our time. Our time, the 21st century, our time, uh, the emergencies that are being discussed right now by the leaders that represent our countries at Glasgow in Scotland. We understand that we have a mission to push forward our ambition to have a more sustainable development model. And this needs to be done at scale, not only in the big capitals of the world, New York, uh, Frankfurt, Tokyo, Shanghai, but also in small villages all around the world. 
The challenge is the same, and the climate change affects everywhere in the world, perhaps even harder in some countries that are far away from this very same big cities. In Brazil, we have a system comprised of 35, 31 um, development uh, finance institutions. We represent roughly 45% of Brazil credits market. We, uh, in the long-term operations, represent 73% of total credit. This is a massive amount of uh, credit, especially in the long term, those projects that really will last and provide a opportunity for a positive legacy for our uh, countries. We know that uh, these, can, these institutions, some of them very small in size, some of them very large, such as BNDS, represented here by our good friend uh, Bruno Aranha, um, they have the expertise, they know the specificities of each sector and especially of each region of a continental country of our size. They partner with the smaller institutions that can finance micro, small and medium enterprises and also municipalities in a country that has more than 5,000 municipalities and I can speak for myself, uh, being also the CEO of a subnational development bank that works with municipalities at scale. So what I see in terms of challenges and opportunities uh, here when we analyze our TFI um, network is first, we have a high level of heterogeneity amidst the institutions. But I think this is a strength from our system. As I said, we are able to gather together cooperatives, credit cooperatives, large national development institutions uh, such as BNDS, such as Banco do Brasil, such as some of the regional development banks like Banco da Amazonia, Banco do Nordeste, BRDE, and also state uh, level institutions, the development agencies. Uh, we have an uh, institution that finances innovation, which is FINAP, and we have a very uh, useful tool, which is the Brazilian's um, uh, uh, small uh, business uh, administration equivalent, the SEBRAE, which uh, enables uh, small businesses to go to grow through uh, technical um, uh, support. We are um, uh, also uh, been working to enhance our capabilities throughout uh, a large array of international partnerships. And in this sense, I must refer to CAF, represented here by our good friend, Jorge Arbashi, who has been a champion since his arrival at the Latin American Development uh, Bank. CAF has been uh, a key uh, player and partner providing the association with uh, technical and financial support for the alignment of the portfolios of our institutions uh, in uh, order to meet the 2030 Agenda uh, ambitious uh, sustainable development goals. Some other partners, such as the French Development Agency, the Inter-American Development Bank, uh, the UK government, the GIZ from the German uh, government, and UNDP have also played crucial roles complementing this effort, which will have, been, will have helped us and support each institution, member institution of uh, the development um, association to mobilize resources from multiple sources and uh, allocate them at the last mile. This is the name of our game. We are last mile development finance institutions that uh, can meet the end point of the production chains that can reach to the small and medium uh, municipalities and respond to the local Specificities, specificities. Uh, we uh, also been engaging in international forum 
And in this sense, I would like to refer some of the commitments that we made either individually as uh, specific institutions, BDMG, uh, or the association. Just last week, we participated in uh, the Marrakesh uh, initiative at COP26 relating to project preparation of sustainable infrastructure projects. Alongside the president, the global president of HSBC, um, representatives from Bank of America, uh, together with Mary Pangastu from the World Bank and Barbara Kushner from CPI, we have uh, shown our ability to do uh, uh, and align with Fast Infra and GFANS in uh, producing a pipeline of feasible, bankable infrastructure projects that international institutional investors can join forces and invest in Brazil. Many other uh, members of the association are also working uh, at this, uh, 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 in this agenda. And of course, BNDS is one of the key players in this sense. Others in different regions of Brazil have also joined forces. Some of us have committed to zeroing the, the uh, fossil fuel finance in our portfolios. Uh, I joined the Minister of Environment of UK, uh, Canada, Denmark, France, and the special envoy from the White House last week to commit to this very uh, important step uh, in zeroing uh, the financing of fossil fuels at BDMG. And it was also a key moment uh, in our history after a year and a half of due diligence when we finally were able to join the Green Bank Network, being the first development bank in the world, world to do so. So these are very firm commitments. Well, these commitments need to have a follow through and they need to dialogue with other financial instruments that we need to provide to our associates in order to sophisticate but more importantly, to enhance the positive impact at the last mile. In this sense, I should refer to the agenda that we are preparing and designing in this specific um, uh, panel uh, will be a, a, a key uh, pillar, a key step of the um, Development Association 2030 Sustainable Development Plan which we want to present to the presidential candidates of Brazil and to the Brazilian society and institutions in general for the next uh, five-year um, uh, policymaking uh, cycle. We are bringing together and engaging the DFIs in Brazil, but also our partners uh, abroad, and some of them are present in this uh, panel and have already supported us uh, in a very concrete manner in the last few uh, months. We've also been launching during COP an important initiative together with the Inter-American Development Bank, which is financing Alliance for the Amazon. This has been uh, probably the number one key issue relating uh, Brazil with the um, uh, international uh, partners and definitely uh, one that has been discussed pretty much every day in uh, Glasgow. And we believe that mobilizing the more than 10 DFIs, members of the association that are present and operating in the Amazon, will help strengthening their role and especially aligning their mandates and portfolios in promoting a greener and more sustainable economy. So this is the challenge uh, for uh, the 21st century development uh, institutions. I want to get to the final part of my uh, um, talk here today, uh, re re referring to the net zero uh, objective. Mitigation of greenhouse and, uh, gas emissions should drive financing resources onto expanding renewable energy sources, increasing energy efficiency, as well as investing in sustainable urban planning solutions together 
with improving access to social and urban infrastructure. Those necessarily require long-term finance that can be provided by DFIs. Therefore, they might be one of the key needed to unlock the net zero goal in Brazil as DFI, as I mentioned before, respond to 73% of the total long-term credit to investments in our good uh, country. The use of other uh, innovative solutions as blended finance instruments will also help raise private resources in an example of a win-win situation and policy that will deal with the negative effects of the COVID-19 pandemic together with the um, uh, climate uh, finance uh, challenge that it's so uh, important to enable those that are present uh, in different regions of Brazil to develop different kinds of productive activities. In this sense, uh, these new instruments and enabling and training our teams will also unlock and open new for sources of financial um, uh, 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 financial uh, lines and partners, and uh, especially private the private sector. And we are ready to partner with the private sector, especially in the project preparation, but also in syndication and co-financing uh, schemes. I'm very eager uh, to hear uh, what my other fellow panelists will uh, bring to you today. I remain at your disposal as the president of the Brazilian Development Association and Development Bank of Minas Gerais to partner, to deepen this uh, collaboration. And I will uh, stop uh, here to hear my fellow panelists. Thank you so much for having us. Sergio, thank you very much. I think that you have provided a very thorough uh, view of what this panel is about uh, and what the role of DFIs is about as well, especially in this context of so many and deep challenges that are, we are facing and have ahead of us. I think that just to stress a few uh, words that you mentioned that I, I believe are very important uh, to put on the table. You, you, you mentioned something like the, the, uh, in the capillarity of uh, DFIs in Brazil. Uh, you also mentioned the contribution beyond all the instruments you, you, you have mentioned, blended finance and so, and so many others. You mentioned um, a project preparation, which I think is also another important contribution for market formation uh, in this sector. And also, uh, you mentioned something that I regard uh, very important as well, which is uh, helping everybody uh, uh, and, and engage everybody on this agenda, especially in a country where uh, income distribution and uh, wealth distribution is so uh, unequal, no? So uh, having uh, a DFIs uh, paying attention to uh, these uh, uh, topics is perhaps extremely important in this uh, special uh, context. I'd like to uh, move over and invite Professor Stephanie Griffith Jones, who is professor at, at Columbia University. Professor Jones, the, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I'm delighted and honored to be uh, participating in this really uh, important panel. And I thank your kind words, Georgia, and also uh, Sergio. Um, we're talking today about the uh, major role which uh, public development banks worldwide can play. I think it's perhaps not enough known that these are already very large actors in the world economy. If we add multilateral, regional, national, and subnational development banks, like the ones that Sergio leads, uh, in total, these banks have, according to IDFC figures, um, recent ones, uh, over almost $19 trillion of assets, $19 trillion of assets, and they're expected to reach by 2020, $20 trillion of assets. And the annual lending and guarantees and so on uh, represent uh, at about over $2 trillion a year, 
about $2.4 trillion a year to be precise, uh, represent around 10% of world investment. So the, the power of these institutions, especially we think of them jointly at a global level and at, in the different countries, is already very large. But I would like to say that I think there's been a sort of renaissance of these public development banks uh, in the last decade. And I think mainly for two reasons. The first one, we've had these two large crises, the global financial crisis, and now the crisis caused by the pandemic, uh, in which we have needed quick response of funding as private finance has dried up due to existing uncertainty. And uh, these development banks worldwide have responded in a major way. For example, according to UN ECLAC in Latin America, uh, national development banks have increased by $90 billion their financing since the pandemic started. And the response is, for example, in Europe, where they have more fiscal space, has been even more dramatic. For example, KFW has increased its lending last year as a response to the pandemic at around 90%, and the European Investment Bank by 63%. So we have these very large actors who can respond to emergency uh, and, and economic problems. But secondly, and in some ways more importantly, they are a valuable instrument for funding the investment that we need to have a major transformation to uh, towards a net zero economy, and also, as Georgia just mentioned, to a more inclusive economy. So they have this uh, very important long-term task which has been shown to be even more urgent at, at Glasgow, uh, given the limitations of existing finance, particularly for poorer and middle-income countries. Um, so as re regards the second function, uh, the development banks at the different levels, multilateral to subnational, can play an absolutely key role to help mobilize uh, their own funds, plus, as has been pointed out, uh, catalyzing additional funding, particularly from the private sector, but also from other organizations and climate funds. So we know that development banks have other functions besides the counter-cyclical one and supporting the structural transformation. They can enhance financial inclusion. They can finance infrastructure given the long-term loans that they have, and increasingly, of course, green infrastructure. And particularly, they have this role of uh, enhancing environmental sustainability and thus mitigating and adapting to climate change. And we have very good examples. Already some have been given, but I like to uh, give an example maybe uh, of the introduction of solar energy in two major countries. One was Germany when solar energy was still quite expensive. KFW, for example, led the way and exclusively provided through commercial banks, but with their own lending money that helped develop uh, solar energy in Germany. But then in China, the opportunity was seized at, of course, a much larger scale, given the large scale of the Chinese economy. And they developed with very important support from the Chinese Development Bank, um, uh, solar panels production at great scale. And this led to a major, contributed to a major reduction in the cost of solar energy, which has benefited not just China, but the whole, whole world. So we have a sort of externality arising from the actions of these two development banks, which are in some ways a, a sort of public good. Um, and uh, as I said, these uh, activities have been done not just with their own resources, important as they are of the development banks, but with their ability to mobilize and catalyze new funding, which is, of course, increasingly important as the world community wants to channel private funding towards meeting uh, zero carbon targets. There is then the issue of risk sharing with the private sector and the design of appropriate financial instruments, 
to attract uh, sufficient private finance, but at the same time uh, to protect uh, the resources of public development banks. I think one role that needs to be emphasized also in the context of climate change is the need uh, for uh, development banks to support innovation, both in existing sectors and companies, plus in the key new sectors. Uh, and for example, we're talking now about green hydrogen, greening steel, greening copper, um, and making electromobility more feasible with the necessary infrastructure. These are major investments required in research and in, in, in actual infrastructure investment and development banks can play a really important role. I want to take one example, which is out of the, um, the field of climate change, but I think which is extremely important. Uh, the, the European Investment Bank, and I think this is not very well known, supported the initial research that BioNTech did to develop the vaccine, which they have produced with, now with Pfizer, and which is one of the best vaccines against COVID. Again, I think a public good produced by these development banks. But I would like to stress, if I may, that there are two key preconditions for development banks to fully uh, uh, fulfill the important role they have in the green transition. One is sufficient scale. And for this, you need to have sufficient capital at all levels. And I think uh, that multilateral development banks are doing a great job, but they would do even a better job if they had more capital, which would allow them to increase uh, their lending more and channel it towards these key resources. And uh, I think there is, at, at that multilateral level particularly, but also perhaps at the national level, some opportunities like the new issue of SDRs. And I know there are studies being made uh, in official circles of how the SDRs could be used possibly in part, the ones that the developed countries would donate uh, because they don't use them uh, to contribute to increasing the capitalization of development banks, at the multilateral, at the regional, but possibly even at the national level. There are, of course, other more traditional ways of increasing capital, which has major leverage. And uh, for example, in the European case, uh, when the European Union member countries increase the capital of the European Investment Bank by 10 billion euros uh, in, in the wake of the Eurozone crisis, uh, the increase that was generated through EIB lending plus contributions from the private sector was 160 billion euros. So there was a multiplier of 16. So there is therefore a, a great potential. This is a great value of development banks that they can provide all this additional leverage by particularly mobilizing private and other sources. Um, and the way that this, for example, is done, partly this leverage is that banks can borrow in domestic and international capital markets to increase their own lending. So even though the capital is public, uh, the funding can be private. And we heard some examples of how Bendes is, is raising uh, money from green bonds. And this is, of course, easier for countries which have deep uh, and large cap domestic capital markets. But even if they do not have them, um, development banks can help uh, create them, it can help create them, precisely through instruments like green bonds, which now have a total market of $800 billion. Um, <clears throat> now, I think uh, that the national and international development banks um, can, should commit as much as possible uh, to incorporate transition to low carbon economies in all financial decisions and project cycles. Um, and I think a very valuable tool is to evaluate all projects at the same time with purely commercial criteria, but also add the environmental dimension uh, in each evaluation, because that will make concrete the commitment to the green transition. 
And I want to mention, uh, I'm sorry to give so many, uh, so much emphasis to the European Investment Bank, but I think it has been pioneering in a number of areas. And one of them has been their use of shadow carbon pricing, which they started doing uh, already over a decade ago. And at the moment, the EIB uses a shadow carbon price of 80 euros per carbon ton for evaluation of projects. And they're expected to increase this to 250 euros per ton by 2030 and 800 euros by 2050. And therefore, in this evaluation, this shadow evaluation, will tilt the decision of the bank towards approving projects that are clearly low carbon. Professor and Jones, the I'm sorry, uh, we are running out of time. If, if sorry. you don't mind to conclude in two minutes, thank you. Sure, I'm, I'm sorry, I apologize. Uh, so uh, the EIB also interestingly is moving towards giving uh, loans that their loans will represent the, to the green transition to low carbon will be 50% of their lending. So I think this is an interesting commitment that maybe some of our other uh, banks can also learn um, to have uh, as, as policies where relevant. Um, I will just finish very quickly. I, I wanted to stress that there are different, of course, financial instruments, that perhaps equity instruments are particularly valuable to help introduce innovative technology in high-risk uncertain projects. And that, as has been mentioned, technical assistance is very important. And I would like just to stress that sharing the experience of uh, different development banks is one of the best ways of technical assistance. And the work that ABDE has been doing and the IDFC has been doing, for example, with the uh, Development Bank Summit, where there's such a rich exchange of experiences, uh, is really an extremely valuable form of technical assistance via peer, if you like, recommendation. So I would just like to finish thanking you all and saying that there is no time to lose and that it is so key to maximize the very large potential of development banks by increasing their own lending and mobilizing as much capital from the private sector as possible. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Jones. J just to stress one single point that you mentioned that you regard as very important. A new context like this one requires uh, new business models. And new business models require uh, innovation. You mentioned that DFI can can do a lot on this on this ground, and I, I think that this is an important point. I'd like to move on and invite Mr. Luis Awazu Pereira da Silva, Deputy General Director of BIS. Mr. Uh, uh, Luis, the floor is yours, and thank you. Nice to see you again. Thank you, uh, Jorge. Nice to see you too. Uh, I'd like to thank IDFC. BDE and the BNDS and also uh, Stephanie, Sergio, uh, Damian, Bruno uh, to participate in this uh, in this panel. Uh, I would uh, certainly concur with a lot of what uh, uh, Stephanie has just said about the key role of development financial institution in in financing uh, the transition to uh, net uh, uh, zero essentially because they are uh, the instruments that can move uh, very fast, uh, finance uh, quite a bit more uh, with uh, including venture capital. They have longer term horizons to assess uh, the social uh, profitability of investments. And indeed, I mean, what we're talking about here is, uh, if I may, a sort of uh, Schumpeterian process of uh, uh, creative destruction. Uh, after all, uh, we have to replace uh, a huge amount of uh, resources of a stock of existing capital that uh, is leading us towards uh, basically, you know, what the IPCC is telling us is between three and four degrees of uh, increase in temperature. So we have to replace this stock of capital by something that is, uh, will drive us to uh, 1.5. And so this is not a small, uh, this is not small, a small achievement. Um, 
I think the climate change problem is now recognized. I think uh, you observe the uh, extreme weather events uh, multiplying and with higher frequency, you have basically uh, more than 100 countries, 132 countries uh, now committed to net zero. I think uh, uh, increasingly this is recognized as not something that is a tail of a distribution type of event, but it's really uh, a new type of systemic risk. We, we call this at the BIS green swan, which means that this is certain to happen if we do nothing. It's not something that is just uh, an event that is very rare. It's, we, are, we are leading towards, we are, we are driving ourselves toward this, this kind of event. And we know, second point, that the carbon budget is shrinking. We have about a maximum of 10 years before hitting a tipping point where uh, basically uh, a very uh, non-linear type of events can be triggered that uh, will have severe consequences, including threatening the viability of life in very vast zones of, of the planet. So there is urgency here in uh, acting. The third point is that uh, uh, we don't have, uh, 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 let's not get into the illusion that there is a miracle solution, uh, a single actor that can just solve uh, uh, the issue of climate change. There is no silver bullet here. You require multiple instruments and uh, a lot of coordination between uh, various actors. The fourth uh, element is that precisely because you need uh, uh, multiple instruments, you have to consider that these instruments are uh, dependent on uh, the local conditions of the local and global political economy. Uh, think of carbon tax. We know it's needed. We know that uh, you can, uh, uh, you have to sort of uh, set an adequate uh, uh, price for carbon, but it's, it's a long and difficult political process to approve this uh, worldwide. Same for regulation. Same for other of the uh, uh, prudential instruments that uh, might help uh, to mitigate uh, uh, climate change. We know that uh, there are good news. Uh, there is uh, a number of initiatives uh, in Europe, in the US, uh, in Asia, uh, mobilizing fiscal resources uh, for the transition. But we know that uh, this, is, uh, this is always uh, complicated. Coordination problems are a very old issue in, uh, in economics, and, uh, and it's not easy to address it in, in a way that creates win-win uh, types of situation. Now, again, good news is that this mobilization of actors is happening. I mean, you guys are, I was at, uh, at the COP a few days ago. I think some of you are already there. You see the alliances that are forming, uh, the alliance, uh, particularly, for example, the Glasgow Alliance of uh, Financial uh, uh, private actors, but also on the public uh, sector side, uh, the one around uh, uh, the development financial institutions, uh, the One Finance Summit, and so on and so forth. Uh, many of you uh, pertain to these types of alliances, so I think this is again a good, a good, uh, a good sign of uh, uh, <clears throat> marrying awareness with with action. Now, um, fifth point. Um, well, uh, if everything is now uh, more clear and the need for action is there, uh, we need to begin uh, continuing some uh, practical steps into uh, the um, uh, uh, financing the, the transition. And there I think there is perhaps a division of labor that is useful uh, between uh, the uh, mobilization of uh, the financial private sector, you know that uh, many are looking into uh, how to construct uh, practically a transition to portfolios uh, that would be compatible with uh, the 1.5 objective of, of Paris. We know that uh, there is a need, and, and probably Damien will, will speak about all, uh, a bit of this, a need for better data, a bit of uh, a need for better taxonomy and uh, uh, you know, uh, di uh, disclosure, such as the one recommended by the TCFD. But these things are making progress in terms of providing a bit more guidance uh, to uh, shifting uh, asset uh, uh, compositions towards uh, uh, 1.5. Uh, now, 
this is on the private side. So what should uh, uh, or what could uh, the uh, the public sector, the development financial institutions uh, uh, do? Well, I think many things that uh, you guys have said uh, are very uh, accurate and, uh, and, uh, and useful. Uh, Stephanie has thought about uh, uh, research. I would, I, I would definitely uh, emphasize this idea of uh, direct financing uh, of uh, investment, uh, green investment projects, but also research. And you have several re reports uh, supporting this. Uh, probably you, you, you read uh, the Stern report for the, uh, the G7. <clears throat> you know that uh, if you look at the last um, interna international agent, uh, energy agency report, you have about 50% of uh, um, green technology advances that are only in a prototype uh, format. If you look at uh, the numbers of the um, uh, government R&D expenditures at the OECD level, uh, you have about more than 300 billion per year, but only 6 billion uh, is focusing on uh, renewable uh, uh, energy. So let me finish by giving you the potential for um, having, in addition to all the points that you made about the role of uh, DFI in financing the, uh, the transition, uh, and again, concurring with Stephanie on the uh, uh, role that they could have potentially if they have a, 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 even a stronger capital base, uh, the multilateral sector and the uh, 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 local uh, regional development bank. One, for example, is the Apollo program. You probably read uh, uh, Nick Stern's uh, um, global Apollo program to combat uh, uh, climate change. I think it's a good idea to focus perhaps in, in one, one or two uh, big projects that can mobilize the souls and minds uh, of uh, uh, engineers, but also uh, uh, practitioners. Think of carbon capture, for example. This is a technology that is uh, only um, in, uh, in, in prototype mode, but it can certainly help. Of course, we, only, we, we need not only to develop uh, uh, industrial carbon capture for uh, storage and uh, utilization, but you need also to preserve the existing natural carbon capture processes that, uh, that we have in uh, natural uh, uh, rain forests. But if you just look at the magnitude, for example, of the Apollo program in the 60s, uh, this was a program that mobilized 5% of uh, GDP of the US in the 60s. So, there is ways in which I think uh, the public sector development institutions can certainly uh, aim at uh, replicating this type of, uh, of uh, initiative in a bigger scale today with the urgency of uh, uh, climate change. Finally, last but not the least, uh, the development uh, financial institutions are probably the best placed to uh, help on the uh, redistributive consequences of climate change policies. We know that they affect uh, climate change, uh, affects primarily poor countries and affect primarily poor households in uh, rich uh, countries. So there is a redistributive dimension where uh, the public sector can necessarily or should necessarily play a mitigating role in uh, uh, allowing at the same time climate uh, policies uh, to be put in place and at the same time protecting uh, vulnerable groups uh, uh, in the transition and in the financing of the transition. So last but not the least, my word here to conclude is that yes, indeed, uh, in this uh, Schumpeterian transformation the public sector is key and the development financial institutions are key. I would think that with the uh, mobilization of uh, commitments from the private sector uh, that was, for example, uh, uh, voiced in the COP26 in terms of commitments of uh, asset transitions towards net zero, there is uh, naturally an alliance between these two that would sort of make uh, uh, things uh, more effective, useful, and have the properties of allowing 
to finance the transition and allowing also to make the transition uh, expansionary and fair from a uh, redistributive uh, perspective. So I, I stop here. Thank you, Jordi. Thank you, Luis. Uh, thank you very much. I, I'd like to emphasize your, uh, one of the, your last points, which is uh, the importance uh, of DFIs on the redistribution dimension of, of uh, climate transition. Uh, it is indeed, in my view, extremely important. And finally, I'd like to invite uh, Damien Navisset, uh, who is a senior climate expert at Cassé de, de, Pose, de Pau. Uh, uh, Damien, uh, the floor is yours. Merci. Bonjour. I hope you can all hear me well. Uh, thank you so much for having me today. I was supposed to be with you in Glasgow, but uh, finally I couldn't make it. The wonders of technology make it possible to, to talk to you from, from, from Paris. Uh, thanks to all my fellow panelists and for their excellent speeches. Um, I hope I will provide some complimentary information to you. Basically, my three points are going to be but first, that net zero goals are completely consistent with the mandates of the public development banks, uh, including the social mandate and economic mandate, um, wherever they are. Secondly, that um, development banks, they, they can, I, I think they are eager to align all the activities and all the instruments uh, along these goals. Uh, of course, adapting it to their country's specific context, as was mentioned before. And last point, um, which is not new <laughs> again, um, it's about the strong role of the banks, public banks, to mobilize the, um, the private sector using the full range of their financial capacity. Uh, first, I need to tell you a little bit about the Caisse de Depot Group. Um, it's the public long-term investor in France, of course, financing the economy. and. Um, for a long time, its business has been about transforming the savings of the French people into uh, uh, local funding for social housing and, and infrastructure. Today, it's become more diverse. We do have this bank of territories, Banque des Territoires, providing uh, funding solutions to, uh, to local, local governments, uh, social housing organizations, public companies, legal professions at the local level. We have also BPI France which is a subsidiary for the private sector, offering loans, guarantees, equity, of course, and advisory support, which was mentioned, it's important uh, to, the, to the companies at the local level, but also when they want to develop their international uh, business. Um, we also, um, de Depot also manages uh, pension funds, one in five pensioners in France, uh, we are the fourth largest investor in France, uh, asset owner, um, so this is, these are bonds, shares, equity in unlisted companies, real estate, but also forests. And of course, um, as a long-term investor over time, uh, we also have become a reference shareholder uh, of companies involved in operating national scale infrastructure in France. Recently, we acquired uh, the French Post. Um, we are a majority shareholder in Transdev, a transport operator, or in, in tourist resort operators in Société Forestière, who is the largest forest management company in France. So we have a very diverse <laughs> role in France. You can see me coming uh, about our role of, uh, for, for carbon neutrality. Uh, I, I strongly believe at, that uh, on top of everything else, and of course, um, consistently with our public mandates, um, the, the leading public finance institution like CDC and, and the members of the IDFC, of course, um, they have uh, a, a role to be at the interface uh, between the public sector and the private sector, and also using this interface to relay the long-term sustainability signals, uh, both national signals and international signals, within their constituencies, because this is the capillarity aspect of, uh, of the public banks. We are deeply rooted in our constituencies. We know the clients, we know the context. So of course, in the example of France, we have this national uh, low carbon strategy, which is very important for, for us and provide us with sectoral scenarios, which we need to make happen in a way. Um, but we also, we need to, to keep in tune with the, the reports from the IPCC, from the EIA. Uh, of course, we are European mem uh, uh, Union member countries, so we have uh, lots of things to uh, 
to to take into account. Uh, uh, some someone mentioned the uh, the EU sustainable uh, finance taxonomy. Of course, this is a very important guidelines. So we need to find the consistency across all these all these signals and to apply them at the local level. So at level. So in the end, quite quite plainly plainly speaking, uh, the Caisse des Dépôts set itself the objective to to significantly contribute to the national low carbon strategy and to align all of its activity on a 1.5 degree scenario. Um, and you, you've seen that the, that the activities are very, are very diverse. Um, and it brings about many opportunities. And I will summarize what we do in three, three, three ways. First, everybody mentioned it, uh, financing more green and sustainable projects and companies. Uh, and this is a real opportunity uh, for CDC, uh, including the, 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 the French Postal Bank, uh, it's 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 about 60 billion euros to be invested in the in the next five years, um, which is um, a, a larger share uh, of of our total finance, of course, more than 30 percent uh, by the end of these five years. Uh, secondly, it's about also importantly uh, eliminating the brown, what cannot be aligned at all. Uh, we no longer comp finance companies in coal, of course, but also we excluded uh, unconventional fossil fuel and. In the future, we need to phase out uh, all fossil fuel. You know, it's an ongoing debate. Uh, it's taking probably more time than it should, but but we are making progress also in, in that regard. And lastly, uh, more green, no more brown, but we need to, in a way, align what can be aligned, uh, which is maybe not green at the moment. So we call it uh, aligning the gray, and that's where aligning the activities with the 1.5 degree scenario takes all its meaning uh, with some dilemmas and difficulty uh, to decide whether to exclude or to accompany. And the two major key takeaways in, it, in that regard is that um, the dialogue with a counterpart uh, can be more effective and more enticing to, uh, to accompany to define the transition pathway than just threatening, threatening to, uh, to sell our shares to perhaps a less demanding investor. And the second takeaway is that on average, in fact, greener investments have proven to be more profitable um, uh, since we've been looking at them in that, in that regard. Uh, in the same line of thought, maybe I should focus a little bit on our role as a long-term investor. Um, when, we, we, when we hold shares in companies and we have this yearly dialogue and we make demands as an investor, of course, as was said before, we are trying to use the TCFD to, to ask for disclosure of the climate risk of a company, to ask, to ask the companies to disclose their strategies to transition to net zero. We uh, ask them to adopt credible targets in the shorter term, not only at 2050, of course. Uh, and we, we, we like it when these targets become uh, key performance indicators, uh, uh, important to, to the managers of, uh, of, of the firms. Of course, we need to adapt our demands to the situation of the, of, of, of the company and their, and their, and their uh, capacity. Um, we need to make ambitious demands yet feasible. Um, we must, uh, we try to, uh, to relay the same message as other investors. So the coalitions of investors are very important. Um, and we find that this is bearing fruit. Uh, we've seen a, a sharp uh, decline in, in carbon intensity of our, of our assets over the last five years. It's impressive sometimes. 66% uh, less carbon uh, intensive corporate bonds. Of course, it's not all due to this dialogue that we implement, but uh, we, we know we're going in, in, the, right, in the right direction. Um, and it's key uh, because uh, one of the perhaps the better ways to convince other investors and companies to to, uh, to commit to net zero is to show that this can yield financial returns and, and, and more and more importantly, also non-financial returns. <laughs> uh, we are all you know, very sensitive to benchmark rankings, ratings. Uh, non-financial reputation has become a very important asset today at a time where NGOs, think tanks, and the media scrutinize uh, everything we do. And that's a good thing, of course. Um, so I think there are many returns uh, in in engaging in this uh, in this uh, in this um, alignment of our of our assets, um, and of course uh, it's not about only about what we do. We need to make sure that 
uh, this is shared and uh, there is some uh, leverage uh, effect uh, on others uh, and not only in financial terms. Um, we've seen in France uh, with the famous Article 173 of the, of the energy law in 2015, and now we see it with the taxonomy, how the legal framework is really a driving engine uh, for, for, for this transition. Um, we, do, uh, we do support uh, a very important aspect of it. It's the harmonization of the standards. Um, I think this is going in the right direction. And there's this issue of, of, of production of data. Of course, it was mentioned before. We finance, for example, the, the Global Reporting Initiative, which works with the EU Commission uh, on, on, on just that. And, uh, and we have also a very specific issue we like to, to promote at CDC, which is the inclusion of biodiversity as well. You know, it's very linked to, uh, to the net zero transition. Uh, and uh, and we have uh, we're trying to uh, to push on that form too. Um, lastly, um, let me also tell you that uh, we we think an institution like CDC, uh, of course, we we are always we have a culture of uh, of being very prudent, not very always very vocal about it, but we try to to to, to play a role to to bring also the the investors community together. Uh, for example, in Paris, we've we've uh, we've uh, helped to create Finance for Tomorrow, which is the club of, of green investors of the Paris Euro Place. Uh, more recently, we've been a founding member of the Net Zero uh, Asset Owners Alliance, um, which is an alliance of 50, 50 institutional investors with more than 10 trillion in assets under management. And they have all taken a pledge to, uh, to align on 1.5 degree scenarios. This really allows us to um, not only have some leverage, but also make sure that we stay consistent with the good practice at the international level and that we are not only uh, playing amongst ourselves in France and Europe, but also uh, in, a wider, in a wider community. So to summarize, uh, and I repeat my opening messages, um, there are no contradictions uh, as a long-term investor uh, between net zero and uh, social and economic mandates that, that we have. In fact, uh, it makes this mandate much more meaningful and much more durable. Um, I can see how the development, development uh, banks throughout the world that used to be at the AFD and, and, and involved with IDFC, I can see how, in fact, these, these banks are already doing, doing uh, a lot. But I go further than this. Everything they do can be aligned, whether they are loan providers or equity providers or, or technical support provider. They, they can, they can um, uh, turn net zero into all their activities uh, using the knowledge of their specific uh, constituency and, and, and country con context. And lastly, um, they can they can wield a huge uh, influence on the, on their constituencies, and not only the private sector, of course, when they invest in company, but also in the, on the local public sector. Municipalities were mentioned, of course. This is this is usually also something in common amongst the development banks. Um, it's important uh, to uh, to introduce also this transition to low carbon in what we do in the public sector. I'll stop here. Thanks again for having me and uh, ready to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Damien. I think that uh, I fully agree with, with you. You stressed uh, a key point, which is uh, the fact that there is no trade-off or no zero sum, it is not a zero sum game between uh, uh, net zero and economic development. This is indeed uh, a very a very key point that uh, should be uh, shared by everyone. I, uh, we have already 15 minutes uh, to go. Uh, I, I think we discussed many interesting and uh, thoughtful points. On the spirit of this uh, conference, and also on the spirit of the or organizers of this uh, of this panel, uh, ABDE, ABD, and BNDES, I'd like to uh, 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 invite you to to share your thoughts about uh, the carbon market uh, and why the carbon market. I, I think that there are many many uh, tasks ahead of us in order to 
for us to tackle the, 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 the climate change, the, the, uh, the, the global warming. But perhaps the, the, the carbon market can uh, play, can do a lot on this regard. And considering that Brazil is perhaps very well placed, in Latin America overall, is very well placed on this, on this agenda, and considering that uh, uh, the carbon market can indeed be part of the solution, not only for the for the own region, but also for for the other regions. Uh, I'd like to hear from you uh, whether and how DFIs can uh, help, uh, uh, what they can do in order to help develop these markets, uh, and what would be the, the 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 instruments or what would be uh, the best way for DFIs to help support this uh, this market. Uh, Bruno, how do you see this this topic? Well, I think that uh, we have uh, a big role uh, to just to stimulate this market. Um, as we as as we said, uh, uh, carbon taxes is very important. The regulation is very important, but uh, we don't know uh, when uh, it will apply. So at the same time, uh, all the big corporations are uh, committing themselves in order to be net zero, uh, and uh, in for this transition. Uh, uh, I do believe uh, that the, carb uh, the uh, carbon credit could be the, the financial ins instrument uh, for this transition uh, to finance uh, uh, new projects. So uh, DFIs could stimulate new projects to su support new projects that are able to, um, to issue uh, these carbon credits, for example, reforestation. Uh, renewable uh, energy and uh, waste management uh, and so support these new uh, projects um, for example we are launching today a match fund uh, for reforestation uh, I think a half, uh, a half billion uh, uh, reais that we will uh, uh, grant uh, BNDS and, and the private sector to stimulate new projects of reforestation in Brazil of native forest, and uh, also using our balance sheet uh, to buy this uh, this credit. So, uh, in order to stabilize or to 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 show the market that we will, uh, uh, we can uh, we can buy this credit, we have the demand, uh, and uh, in another sense, uh, like to to uh, uh, to support the the, the accreditation, uh, the the, pro the service provided that we accreditate this this credits in order to uh, to for the the, the corporation feel uh, uh, secure in order to uh, 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 in order to buy these credits so we can uh, support the new projects uh, 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 buy this credit transact these credits in order to offset our uh, our carbon print or also to sell for our clients in, uh, uh, in order to offset there are new projects, so we can do a lot in the voluntary uh, uh, carbon market in order to stimulate, organize this market, and uh, so I do believe that we have uh, like a, a main role in this in this sense. Thank you, Bruno. Uh, uh, Sergio, uh, we know that for this market to to, to take off, it will require uh, an, a kind of infra infrastructure. Being, uh, I mean, uh, uh, different services that, in the end of the day, will support this market in a way that it will be it will be credible, it will have a reputation. Uh, buyers will be happy to buy, sellers will be happy to sell in that market. Consider that uh, it is hard to believe that we will have several markets around the world over the coming years, and we will probably have a f only a few markets down the road. What DFIs could do in order to help establish uh, a regional market in Latin America? Thank you, uh, Georgie. Um, I, I think we already have uh, some uh, experience around the world of particular initiatives in time, some lessons learned from the initiatives in Europe. We now uh, see initiatives in, in China. 
where uh, the regulators and the policymakers uh, have been playing a key role in terms of determining the long-term success of those markets. This is a crucial week as Article 6 is being discussed uh, of the Paris Agreement is, this, is being discussed uh, in Glasgow. We've been following in the news the stances of different um, uh, countries uh, present. I think <clears throat> there are a few things that DFIs can do, especially when they are together in different uh, bundles. Uh, that is, of course, the Brazilian Development Association. I'm also the vice president of the Latin American Development Finance uh, Asso Institutions Association. Alide was a very important uh, role, but most importantly, this dialogue between the very large multilaterals, and, and, and Stephanie has made reference to a very relevant player and partner of ours, which is the European Investment Bank, um, EID, that has been a front runner in this respect. We have been uh, collaborating and having direct dialogues with um, Lord Stern's um, uh, team and, and, and key collaborators, such as Josue Tanaka, uh, formerly MD at the um, EBRD. And in Brazil, in terms of very concrete actions, uh, which spread throughout the region is really uh, uh, through the uh, what we call the lab. The lab is an initiative that we launched four years ago together with the Brazilian SEC, the CVM, the Inter American Development Bank, GIZ, and, and of course the association. And now the lab gathers more uh, than um, 100 participants, including BNDS, several teams. They are very involved in the many discussions. So I believe that, yes, Latin America, South America, especially because of the Amazon, but Latin America in general, if you look at Costa Rica and other countries, what they've been uh, doing in the sector, they definitely, uh, we definitely have a, a large uh, pool of projects and opportunities that have high potential to, pay, to play a key role. And in the sense, CAF being the Latin American Development Bank and and especially your position in the private sector side of, 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 of CAF in, in designing, in partnering with the regulators, with the stock exchange, in aligning a common policy uh, for the implementation of Article uh, 6 once we are able to advance. I think we can position ourselves uh, as, um, uh, as a hub for uh, the carbon market. Look at the collaboration that already happens in the stock markets of uh, Colombia, Peru, and Chile with the, um, with the co collaboration through what is called the MIGA arrangement. If we are able to make um, a such similar arrangement involving perhaps uh, Brazil, um, Argentina, and Mexico, and some of the other Central American uh, countries, they are front runners we could definitely be on the vanguard of the carbon markets, and this will certainly help um, deploy um, the capital for the objectives of the Paris uh, Agreement and the Agenda 2030. And the development banks of different sizes can play, as Bruno said, uh, uh, key instruments, not only in, in backing, in, in buying, in launching programs, in doing the project, uh, preparation in, in shedding light and training uh, our teams and our clients. Many ways we, we are, with our program, also pushing our clients, incentivizing them uh, to go in a different uh, di di direction. I think that Luis Awazu uh, touched a key point, which is new technologies, the startups. I do believe, and I tell my team all the time, we will not be financing the same type of infrastructure and the same type of projects and companies. We should be looking at different solutions. And this includes engineering, this includes IT, this includes urban planning and architecture, this includes new uh, solutions that can be propelled by uh, these new instruments as long as we are able to support 
this transition. We are living in a time of transition. We should play our role and fulfill our mandate uh, as a 21st century development bank. Thank you, Sergio. Luis, uh, although the carbon market is still uh, in uh, its... Sort of, uh, yeah. No, Jorge, I think we're short of time, and I think uh, Stephanie probably and and, uh, and also Damien need to speak. So, I'm sorry, this so is Professor quickly. Jones. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, Professor, Professor Jones, uh, what's your view about this, uh, about this, uh, this issue? Um, I, I think actually Luis should speak as well, because I'm sure he has a lot of knowledge. I mean, I, I, I agree with what has been said, the development of the carbon market is is very important. Um, I would also like to emphasize what Sergio has just said is the importance of venture capital and support for startup companies uh, which can uh, propose innovative solutions. I think in Latin America there's been a, a, a rapid growth, for example, recently of unicorns, which are companies that have over a billion dollars of assets. Um, partly through this startup process. Um, I think the carbon market uh, can play an important role. We also have to learn lessons from previous experiences because I think the, the initial launch of the, of the carbon market in Europe had some quite serious uh, teething problems because the price carbon was very low. Um, but I think they're being remedied. So I, I think it is again an element of the puzzle. Uh, one thing, if we're talking more broadly, if I may quickly mention, uh, which we haven't discussed, is I think uh, elements of financial regulation, uh, which could encourage further the private sector, besides the measures that we have been discussing, uh, to lend and invest more in low or zero carbon projects. I mean, there's a lot of activity amongst regulators a lot of very interesting modeling and so on, scenario building, which is very valuable. Uh, but I don't think there has been enough action in terms of uh, possibly changing capital requirements or reserve requirements to encourage green and discourage brown. And I think this could uh, complement whatever, for example, is being done through other mechanisms like the role of DFIs in catalyzing private finance uh, to, um, uh, to, to, to greener activities and discouraging brown. I think that is also a very important element to influence the vast flows that are channels through the private sector. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Professor Jones. Uh, uh, Luis, what's your take? And if, if you could say a word on... on uh, uh, this is a this market is is still on its early stages. Uh, the, the kind of projects and the way we monitor this market is still also on, on its early stages. We are still to develop but with good monitoring uh, schemes and and, and and instruments. To what extent this this market can affect uh, uh, the financial uh, George, markets, the uh, and capital markets? Look, uh, uh, to be a uh um, to complement what uh, all of you over you guys have said, I mean, look, obviously it's very important to develop the right price uh, of carbon. After all, this is the tra the classical solution is to tax the negative externality, but it has to be at a global level. We know it's it's complicated and difficult. Uh, again, for for also for political economy reasons, the the uh, the way in which it transmits into the uh, the whole economy has a uh, uh, redistribution of uh, consequences we saw some of the uh, resistance to uh, taxing uh, or to having higher energy prices for example in many in many societies so and then you have uh, technical difficulties for having uh, these so i'm not saying it's not important to develop the market for carbon pricing to have the adequate pricing but we are in a kind of an urgency mode here. So we need also to work on multiple other solutions that imply working on quantities as well. After all, the pricing was a means through which you would shift resources from uh, brown to green 
through changes in relative prices. That was the whole idea about the Pigovian taxation here. And, and we know that it's necessary. But I think we also know that in parallel to that, given some of the uh, political economy difficulties of uh, constituting this transmission mechanism, that uh, working on, on quantities, for example, work, we know now that uh, it's necessary to have better data on firms emission uh, in order sort of that to, to activate mechanisms for having the financial sector uh, be uh, have a better knowledge of their uh, exposures to risk. Yeah. And the data on, on, on firms emission is one of the uh, sort of uh, primary requirements now uh, that uh, the TCFD is, uh, is requesting, that uh, many uh, uh, firms in the financial sector are requesting for extending uh, or at least to understanding the, uh, the exposures to risks, to, to climate-related uh, risks uh, uh, that they are, and also to be able to act on this, to reallocate uh, financial resources toward, towards lower emitters. So my take here is that, yes, indeed, let's work on developing as, as well as we could, as fast as we could, the uh, right pricing for, uh, for carbon through the best possible uh, market mechanisms that we can find. But let's also uh, consider the urgency of working on quantities. And working on quantities meaning that we need to understand firms' emissions, that we need to understand the way in which uh, the financial sector can also work uh, on being a bit more selective in portfolio allocations through the uh, examination of uh, basically the uh, granular data that we can, we can have uh, on, on carbon emission at uh, the, the firm uh, level. Thank you, Jorge. Thank you, Luis. Uh, Damien, what's your take? Uh, very briefly, thank you. Um, I, I, may, I may be tempted to make a joke uh, if, I, if I say that uh, climate change is a big market failure and, and we try to address it uh, through another market. It may be uh, a bit paradoxical. But that's not my personal point of view. I think the carbon markets are important. I, I would like to concur with what's just been said. Uh, we, if there's a, a carbon market, we can, we, can, we can try to use it and to support it. But there's also a wealth of things that we can do in-house as, 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 uh, as finance institutions to, to put a price on carbon. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think the, the, the carbon markets are just a, a tool amongst others to put a price on carbon. That's, that's what matters. Uh, so it's up to the governments to 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 organize it as they as they see fit. But irrespective of that, as a, as a bank, and I think the example of the EIB was given by Stephanie, we can try to 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 use the um, uh, conventional value for carbon uh, and uh, make it uh, grow and and increase over time to uh, to shift uh, capital allocation from from brown to to green. And I think um, this price on carbon can take many forms including inside a, a, a bank. Uh, this carbon price is good for, uh, for, for loan evaluation, for example, to assess the profitability of infrastructure. As an investor, uh, when you have shares in a company, um, then it's the same question, but the tools uh, used to, to include the, the price of carbon can be, can be different. When you talk to, uh, to, a local, uh, to a local government, it's another, uh, another sport again. Uh, so we should not wait and, and put all our eggs in the basket of the market and, and, and recognize that we can act uh, fast. Damien, thank you very much. We, we, we are running out of time. And I, I would, I'd, I'd like to give the floor for, for one only single question here in the audience. A quick question, please, and then a, a, a quick answer uh, of one or two of you. OK, uh, thank you very much. My name is Clara. I'm a PhD candidate at the Eindhoven University of Technology, and also a chapter scientist and contributing author for the IPCC report on the chapter of innovation, technology development, and transfer. And um, so my question relates to the uh, to the fact that it's not a zero-sum game between uh, economic development and uh, the energy transition, and that there are actually a lot of opportunities for uh, achieving both, right? Uh, but we see that for emerging markets and developing countries, it's sometimes very difficult to mobilize those economic benefits. So my question is, like, what can DFIs do 
in terms, I mean, what have they been doing or what could they do in order to maximize the synergies? And maybe related to the, um, yeah, to the role of banks also in fostering innovation and maybe helping developing countries and emerging economies to also participate in those uh, global networks for innovation. That's it. Excellent, thank you. Who would like to react? Very quickly, please. Well, I, I, I think just a part of the, the, the question, I think that we can really re uh, conciliate the, the development and also the, the, the in order to be a, 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 a just transition, uh, for example, in Brazil, uh, BNDS, BNDS has a, a huge role in order to support a, a, a renewable energy. And uh, I think that 10 years ago, uh, Brazil doesn't have uh, uh, any any uh, wind. Uh, wind and solar were not part of uh, our energy matrix. So BNDS with low ones and uh, with uh, using the, the public market supported uh, uh, um, a lot of uh, projects in the northeast of Brazil, which is uh, uh, the, our poorest area. And, uh, and after 10 years, 10%, uh, uh, 15% of our in energy matrix will be uh, made by uh, wind and solar. So uh, I think that we can really conciliate. Uh, we have a lot of um, a lot of uh, initiatives in the innovation uh, with a, a corporate venture. Uh, I think that w we can, uh, as uh, DFIs and, and, and corporations, and trying to to, uh, uh, to 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 invest in uh, these corporate ventures, you know, that with uh, hydrogen, uh, green hydrogen, and also uh, a lot of uh, innovation using e equity. So I think that we we, we have a, a, a route uh, in order to be part of these uh, uh, these innovation schemes uh, uh, in Brazil uh, and also in the, in the emerging markets. So I think that too. Thank you, Bruno. Uh, with that, we we are coming to the close of this of this panel. I'd like to to to, to thank all the panelists for this very very insightful uh, panel, a very uh, timely panel. Uh, to 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 thank you in the in the audience here and over the internet, and uh, thank you very much to all, and have a great day. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank bye you. bye. Bye. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Au revoir. Bye.